Hello, everybody. This is Augustus Corbett. Thank you for tuning in to Walking in the Word. Well, today I'm back at the lake. It's a really nice day. Not too hot, not too cold. And there is, as always, a little breeze coming off the lake. So it should be a pretty good walk. My wife and I intend to walk two miles today. I know that doesn't sound like a lot for you young whippersnappers, but she and I are getting on up there in age. So getting in a two mile walk, it's gonna be a good one. It's gonna be challenging too. Anyway, when I do these walks, I like to share something from God's word with you. So what I have on my heart today is, I wanna talk to you about a vision that God gave me, a vision, an evangelistic vision, if you will, an evangelistic vision of reaching, it's gonna sound crazy, I'm telling you, I'm telling you before we even get started, but it's an evangelistic vision of reaching one million African-American men for Jesus Christ by the end of 2025. That's roughly two and a half years from now. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds crazy. One million African-American men for Christ taking God's kingdom to one million men, African-American men, for Christ, but that is the vision that God has given me. Now, I can't do it by myself. I'm gonna need help. So I'm hoping that some of you will see the need for taking God's kingdom to African-American men. I'll get into why we need to do that in just a moment, but I need your help. I need your help in a, number of, in, in a number of ways. I need your help, first and foremost, prayer. I need your help in helping me accomplish this by putting in the legwork. I need your help financially. I need your help getting the word out. So I need your help in a number of ways. And some of you can help in all those ways. Now what we intend to do, my wife and I, we are seriously considering using a considerable, a considerable amount of our time in the future, going from major city to major city to major city, street preaching. Now, we know that that's not gonna bring us in contact with the million men, but it will introduce us to some of you who may be willing to help us. So we got, I mean, big cities in mind. You know, of course, the New York City area, Philadelphia, DC, um, over on the West Coast, L.A., Oakland, um, here where we live, of course, Dallas, Houston, in between Chicago, Detroit, um, Memphis, you know, many different cities where there is a high number of African-American men. So we're intending to go into those cities and we're basically going to preach the gospel. He sees you, he seeks you, and he saves you if you will open your heart unto him and ask him into your heart and into your life. You may have a good job, good career. You may have a wife or husband who loves you. All those are blessings. But that doesn't mean that life is good for you because if you're not saved and if you do not wake up from your sleep tonight, 
we're going to do some street preaching. We would love for you to come out. Now, of course, if, if, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you already know what the Lord said, or at least you should. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, the Lord said, all power have been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, making disciples of, of, of people, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you until the end of the world. That is what is known as the Great Commission. That is where the Lord commissioned everyone who is a Christian to be involved in the work of evangelism and what Paul calls the ministry of reconciliation. We all have that duty. I don't care if you are not an ordained minister, even if you don't consider yourself a minister at all, whether ordained, licensed, or whatever, it doesn't matter. That is a commission that the Lord gave to everyone. No one is excluded who is a part of his kingdom. That's what we have been commissioned to do, taking God's kingdom to people around the world. The Lord gave me this vision specifically in the early 90s. And it wasn't a vision of reaching a million African-American men, but it was taking his kingdom to African-American men. I remember it very well. I was involved in inner city ministry in the city of Durham, North Carolina. And by the way, of course, um, North Carolina is my home state. So we intend to hit all points in North Carolina, Raleigh, Durham, Greensboro, Fayetteville. There are many cities there that have a large population of African-American men. We intend to go to all those areas, Wilmington, North Carolina, where I'm from, that, that area, Jacksonville. So I was doing ministry, inner city ministry in the city of Durham. If you know anything about Durham, North Carolina, you know it has a lot of inner city ills, a lot of urban problems, drugs, gangs, poverty, failing schools, the whole works. I went to law school there at North Carolina Central University School of Law. I'm also an Aggie graduate. So I lived a number of years in the Greensboro, North Carolina area. So I'm well, well familiar with the issues and entanglements of the things that get African-American men oftentimes jammed up. As an attorney, I see it all the time. I've represented probably thousands of brothers in the criminal court system at this point in my career. I have been practicing law now going on 17 years. And before I practiced law, I was a, a high school chemistry teacher. So I literally saw how public schools fail African-American males. And I wrote a book on it, actually. Go to YouTube. My book is entitled Education and Justice, How Public Schools Fail African-American Males. Grab a copy. Anyway, my wife and I were doing ministry, inner city ministry in Durham, North Carolina. And we were not seeing a lot of fruit. A lot of brothers were not responding to the gospel. A lot of them were murdering each other, selling drugs. I mean, all the issues that we see plaguing African-American men. And it was, it was disheartening, distressing. 
when God has put something on your heart, it tends to just distress you. It tends to just break your heart when you see the condition of the people that he's called you to reach. And that's how I, that's how I felt and that's what I have actually lived with over the past, oh, 40 years. God put this in my heart when I was a young person. And it crystallized, when I say it, I'm talking about this calling, this burden to reach African-American men for Christ. It crystallized in 1993. That was before some of you were born. But here's what happened in 1993. In January of 1993, I received a phone call from my first cousin, Tracy. It was about three o'clock in the afternoon. And she said to me, Mike is dead. I remember those three words. Mike is dead. Mike was my last baby younger brother. In 1987, I had already lost another younger brother. His name was Leon. He lived and died in New York City, in Jamaica, Queens. And I preached Leon's funeral. Leon was 16 years old when he was murdered. To this day, we still don't know who murdered Leon. I preached Leon's funeral, one of the hardest things I ever did in my life. That was 1987. Six years later, I get another phone call that my last baby brother, Mike, was dead. Mike had been shot through the heart with a high-powered rifle. Those who were around him when he took his last breath, they said that it was an accident. And that was the way law enforcement and the court system treated it. That it was an unintentional thing. He was around friends and family. And someone was cleaning that high powered rifle and it went off. The bullet pierced Mike's heart killed him almost instantly. It's my baby brother. I loved him with all my heart. Both him and Leon, I felt like it was my responsibility to protect them. And I felt like I had failed. I remember about two weeks before we found Leon, I talked to him on the phone and I told him, I said, man, I'm coming to get you wherever you are. We knew that he was involved in some drug dealing. We knew that he was involved in some things that could cost him his life. And I told him I was coming to get him. And he told me, don't do that because the people that he was associated with would not like it and would probably try to harm me whether I was his brother or not. But that didn't matter to me. But I couldn't find him and he wouldn't tell me where he was. And again, it was about two weeks later that we found Leon dead. Still don't know what killed him or how they murdered him. Let's put it that way. It was a murder for sure, but we don't know how they did it. <sighs> Again, six years later, I get this call about Mike. Freaked me out. I preached Mike's funeral. Never forget it. It was Again, one of the hardest things I've ever done in life. But I took the occasion to do two things. Number one, at his funeral, I preached a hard message of salvation. I preached that the death of my brother laying right here in front of every one of us in that funeral proves that the gospel is true. Because it's the gospel that tells us that we were made from dust and dust we will return. Mike had returned to the dust that God made him out of 
which is what we all will do. Every single one of us has a date with death. Every single one of us. And after that date with death, we also got to give God, we got to stand before God in judgment. If you're a believer, the judgment will be about what you did to advance God's kingdom. Unlike those who died outside of Christ, their judgment will be whether or not they will spend eternity in the lake of fire. That's another message for another day. So I preached that message at his funeral and lots of people got saved that day at his funeral. But I also pledged to the Lord that I'd spend the rest of my adult life trying to reach African-American men with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Another part or the reason for that was because I was in the streets harder than Mike or Leon, or just as hard, but God has spared my life. There were many days, many nights when I went in the streets where I could have easily lost my life, easily, just like Mike and Leon. But for the grace of God, God spared me and he kept me from meeting the fate that my two younger brothers met. And by the way, I grew up with four other boys. I'm a part of two different families. I'm biologically connected to one family. And then it was another family that raised me. And between those two families, there were five boys. All four of those boys other than myself are dead. None of them reached the age of 35. My youngest brother, Edoff, died when he was 12 or 13 from appendicitis. Then Leon died when he was 16. Mike died when he was 20. And my older brother, Bill, died when he was um, about 31, 32. I have outlived all of them. <sighs> I'll be 62 my next birthday, God willing. So for those reasons, I know how Satan targets African-American men. I know personally from the time we are born until the time we take our last breath, we are targets of hell. We are targets of darkness. We are targets of demons who are constantly trying to kill us. You see it. You go to any major city, who's dying more than, than anyone disproportionately? It is black men. Black men, the leading cause of death for black men is homicide. That's not true for any group of men other than black men. And that's because we are targets of Satan. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter six that <clears throat> we wrestle not against flesh and blood, <clears throat> but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness, <clears throat> against spiritual wickednesses in high places. In other words, Satan and all his demons are focused and targeting African-American men. That's why we die disproportionately and experience the things that we experience disproportionately, mass incarceration, so many other things, police, brutality, uh, so much poverty. There is a hit out on us. There's a target on our backs. And the only solution 
It's not politics. That's not the solution. Although I encourage you to vote, I encourage you to be active politically. Ultimately, that is not the solution for anyone, including African-American men. The solution is becoming a member of the kingdom of God. And so back to why I'm committed to reaching one million African-American men, because it is my job, the Lord told me when I sought him again about my Durham ministry and how it, how it wasn't reaching many young black men <clears throat> and how many churches in most communities are not reaching young black men. And I took that to the Lord. I said, Lord, we're just not reaching these, these young, young black guys. They're not in church. They're turned off from church. Many don't want anything to do with church. Many have been told that Jesus is a white man and Christianity is the white man's religion and the Bible is the white man's book. Many have been turned off from the Lord. And I cried out to God, I prayed, I begged him, give me the solution. And the Lord told me, take them my kingdom. Again, the Lord told me, take them my kingdom. Those four words. That was God's specific instruction to me. Take them my kingdom. That was in 1994. I remember that conversation I had with the Lord like it was yesterday. And so fast forward what would be what, 39 years later, I believe, I'm still on that quest. Still on that quest. If it's not 39, it's 29 years, pardon my math. But I'm still on that quest of taking God's kingdom to African-American men. And so as I, as I ponder um, how to do that, again, I know I'm going to need a lot of help from you. Of course, first and foremost, I need the Holy Spirit's help. But I already know I have the Holy Spirit's help because the Holy Spirit is going to help me accomplish anything the Lord told me to do. The Holy Spirit is my very ever-present help. So I know he's with me, but I need boots on the ground. I need boots on the ground. I need people who will commit themselves to this vision, who see the need as I do, who see in their own cities, in their own families and neighborhoods, African-American men being dropped like flies, how Satan is destroying them unlike any other group in this country. As a matter of fact, that's true across the globe. Go to any continent and you'll find the same, very same pathologies. And the answer is the same, the kingdom of God. I need boots on the ground. I need people, men, women, black, white, Hispanic, Latino, African, Arab, it doesn't matter. Asian, so long as you are committed to reaching young black men for God, I need you. I need you. They need you. God needs you. Please get in touch with me. You're probably watching this on the Salt Makers Church YouTube channel or you may be watching this on the Gap YouTube channel, just reach out to us through those YouTube channels. We're waiting to hear from you. Reach out to us. There will be information, there is information on both of those channels. I need to hear from you. I need your help. 
All right, again, I'm Pastor Corbett, Augustus Corbett, and I just wanted to share with you the vision that God has given me to reach one million African-American men by the end of 2025. That only gives me two and a half years. That is not a lot of time, but together we can do it. Together we can do it. Like prime time, Deion Sanders says, do you believe? Do you believe? I believe that we can do it. Reach out to me. Peace and love.